fires, floods, heat waves, and droughts. For these reasons and more, U.S. climate migrations have begun. Will your city become a ghost town, or will it become crammed with migrants? Either way, what can you do about it? Not to worry. As perhaps the only permaculture urbanist, I've got you covered. In today's episode, I'll be sharing some strategies that U.S. cities can use to reduce the harms, heal the land, and prepare for big population changes. Welcome to Edenicity. Best Practices for Sustainably Abundant Cities. Okay, let's start with this map by ProPublica. It's an amazing report, very well worth a visit. It opens with the same data set that we used in the previous episode, showing the human climate zone, which is an amazingly narrow band of temperature between 11 and 15 degrees Celsius, or about 52 to 59 degrees Fahrenheit. What we're looking at right here is a map of the United States temperature regime as it stands today. So the green areas are are the most comfortable areas to live right now. And they've drawn a contour around that most comfortable temperature band. Now plugging in the medium scary climate model for 2070, you can see that that band shifts a little bit north. Plugging in the most scary climate model to date, you can see that the band goes way north to the Canadian border. Now, obviously, what this means is that the southern part of the country will be experiencing a lot more heat. What they're mapping here is the number of days that have temperatures exceeding 95 degrees Fahrenheit. That must be 35 degrees Celsius. Now, of course, comfort is not just a matter of heat. It's also, say it with me, the humidity. Here's a map of the projected change in humidity due to climate change with the moderate model and the extreme model. And you can see that Arizona gets pretty terrible and parts of the Midwest get almost as bad and Southern Louisiana gets even worse. And a few isolated parts of the Southeast coast get really pretty terrible. Again, assuming the worst. What about other effects? Well, this study looked at large wildfires. And as you can see, it's pretty terrible west of the Rockies with a few additional dots in Northern Minnesota, Arkansas, and Southern Florida. Well, of course, with climate change comes sea level rise due to melting polar ice caps and glaciers throughout the world. And the areas that are affected appear on this map. And of course, these would be all of the coastal areas with Louisiana suffering and the entire eastern seaboard suffering. And as you can imagine, the temperature effects will take a toll on crops but it won't necessarily be a negative impact everywhere. In this plot, the purple areas, mainly in Texas and the entire southeast coast, and a few parts of California and Arizona, will see substantial crop losses. So it just gets too hot for most crops. But in the north, especially in the upper Midwest and the Great Lakes states, you can see that the temperatures at least get better for crops. Now, all of this, of course, has economic consequences. When they add up the rising energy costs, lower labor productivity, poor crop yields, and increasing crime, we see that a lot of areas lose economically. But because of the increased ability to grow grain crops in the north, we see that there are some regions that benefit. So as you can see, this is a really granular study. They're looking at it county by county throughout the United States. It's really an amazing piece of work. So the question you might be wondering is, well, what about my county? What about counties that I might be interested in moving to. Well, they've got you covered. They have a list of all of the counties rated according to all six of these climate risk categories. And you can scroll through the list or search through it using this dialogue, find your county, and it'll show you graphically on the maps where they are. And, um, you know, I guess you just have to use your browser's find function to look up your own county on this map. But basically, the Counties with the highest climate risk are at the top here, and then we can sort the list according to each of the different criteria. So several Arizona and Texas counties dominate the heat risk. We can look at the very large fire risk. That's gonna be Idaho, Nevada, Oregon, California, and so forth. We can look at economic damage. That's sort of spread throughout the Southeast, North Carolina, Florida, Louisiana, Georgia. And we can scroll to the bottom of the list as well. I'm gonna reset this to the combined risk and scroll to the bottom to see the regions that are favored under this scheme. As we can see, counties in Vermont, Maine, New York, Colorado, Michigan, and a few other places are at the lowest risk according to this plot. So again, if you want to know how your county stacks up, this is the place to go. ProPublica, I'll put a link in the comments. And while you're there, be sure to leave a like. And if you see that subscribe button, go ahead and gently tap it so that you don't miss out on future deep dives like this. Now, this is not the whole story. There's also this really clever paper that appeared in the journal Nature in 2022 that 
took the climate models and then made a prediction of the vapor pressure deficit to figure out where there would be a higher risk of floods and droughts. Now, the vapor pressure deficit is a measure of the difference between how much moisture the air can hold at a given pressure and temperature and how much water it does hold. And where that number is big, that means basically that it's very dry. That's when the land can dry out very quickly, vegetation can dry out, and you have a very high risk of drought. Where there's a high risk of drought, you then begin to lose a lot of the living biomass that can buffer rainy conditions. And it's also correlated with higher temperatures so that the air can become super saturated with moisture before it finally releases. And so when it does release, when you do have rain, it's much more catastrophic. Now, this paper goes through a whole bunch of scenarios, but I want to direct your attention to this figure here, which runs predictions from five out to 50 years through the different climate models, showing the risk of floods and droughts. And as you can imagine, the, the darker red to purple regions are the higher risk areas. To me, the interesting thing is that some of these areas at the highest risk 50 year mark, like Wisconsin, were actually favored in the ProPublica report. When you look at more complete modeling, including the risk of floods and droughts, the areas that come under threat are much more extensive than if you just look at temperature alone. It gets worse. This paper, Dust Impacts of Rapid Agriculture Expansion on the Great Plains, used satellite images and ground dust measurements to determine that the amount of dust going into the atmosphere has been increasing in the United States in recent years, and this is correlated with increased agriculture, and you'll see why that's a big problem in a moment. So let's take a step back and understand why dust is a problem. Students of U.S. history would know that between 1933 and 1937, there was the Dust Bowl. This was a series of dust storms in the Great Plains, starting in South Dakota, into Nebraska, Kansas, Oklahoma, Arkansas, Missouri, Iowa, Texas, Colorado, and New Mexico. And these weren't like little dust devils or anything like that. These were giant walls of dust that extended for well over a thousand miles all the way to the East Coast. In his book, Dirt, which I've linked in the description, David Montgomery reminds us that the U.S. Geological Survey, a government agency, warned us about this danger in 1902. He writes, in 1902, the 22nd annual report of the U.S. Geological Survey concluded that the semi-arid high plains from Nebraska to Texas were fatally vulnerable to rapid erosion if plowed. The high plains, in short, are held by their sod. Needless to say, this warning was not heeded. And as a result, by 1940, due to the dust storms, 3.5 million Americans were displaced. And in this picture, you can see that the dust, which completely stripped the topsoil from some areas, absolutely buried other areas so that the machinery and homes weren't working. And by the way, the dangers in the dust were not just a matter of clogging machinery and burying things. It was, of course, very damaging to the lungs, not just in terms of particulates clogging your lungs mechanically, but also in terms of a number of fungal diseases carried by the dust. This was a fatal catastrophe that engulfed a large fraction of the nation for days on end, intermittently for years. In his book, Montgomery describes how Hugh Bennett testified before the Senate Public Lands Committee about the need for a national soil conservation program. Bennett knew that a great dust storm from the plains was descending on Washington, D.C. With help from field agents who called to report the progress of the dirt cloud, he timed his testimony so that the sky went dark as he presented it. Duly impressed, Congress appointed Bennett head of the new Soil Conservation Service. So the risk of dust storms is no joke. Now let's look at that study that I mentioned earlier. So here's the observations of extra dust in the atmosphere with hot spots in North Dakota down through Oklahoma. And here's the percent change in cropland coverage. And you can see that they are more or less very similar. And um, the paper goes on to determine the statistical correlations and relevance and basically make their case. The point is that we're plowing too much again, breaking up very fragile sod in very fine soils, and exposing large areas of the country again to the risk of a dust bowl in a warming climate where there's a good chance of drought in the future. All right, let's bring all of these risks together and look at what areas are burdened and which ones 
might see some growth. Now, obviously, the ProPublica report would be your go-to in addition to the reports that I cite in detail here. But in general, the burdened areas include areas prone to fire, which would be the entire Southwest, and a few hot spots, if you'll forgive the pun, in northern Minnesota, Florida, and Arkansas. Areas burdened by heat would include the entire Southwest again, a band from Louisiana all the way up through the Ozarks, and the southeast coast. Areas burdened by drought and flood would include the west central states, Texas through North Dakota, Louisiana through Minnesota, and Illinois. The entire south would be burdened by crop damage in a likely climate scenario. And the Great Plains, once again, would be subject to a risk of dust storms. And finally, all of the coastal areas face rising oceans due to polar cap and glacial melt throughout the world. Now for growth areas, in general, the Northwest, the Canadian border, the mountain states, the Great Lakes, and a few miscellaneous counties in every state could see some growth as a result of climate change. But the question is, is this the actual pattern of migration that we're seeing today? Well, a little bit yes and a little bit no. Let's have a look. This is the latest census data on population change county by county throughout the United States. And as you can see, coastal California at least is seeing an exodus, as is Illinois and the Snowbelt states. And also, not too surprisingly, the mountain states are seeing some growth, as is Michigan and Indiana. But in complete defiance of the climate predictions, Arizona and Texas and especially Florida are seeing a boom. In Florida's case, a billionaire boom. So this is where people are really going today. Now, I've seen a few city plans and Vision 2050 documents, and most of these up until a couple of years ago were completely backward looking. They were focusing on surveys and past patterns of land use and extrapolated their growth based on the patterns that were already apparent in the cities. But with climate change, we're looking at really big external forces. So even though Florida is seeing a lot of growth, it has enough threats in terms of climate, that it really has very little room for error to sustain that growth. So let's look at what burdened areas need to do to mitigate threats that they're facing. Areas facing heat, drought, floods, dust storms, and low crop yields need to focus on restoring grasslands, watersheds, and forests, ASAP. They need to control grazing, and that's no joke. During the 1930s Dust Bowl, one of the things that the Soil Conservation Service did was order the slaughter of farm animals, including some six million pigs, to reduce the pressure of animal agriculture on the landscape. So controlling grazing is a really large-scale endeavor. Meanwhile, while cities need to reduce urban pavement with intercity rail and transit-oriented development, just as we talked about last time, and manage runoff with natural drainage basins and urban forests. I thought I'd give you an illustration of how that looks from this book here. This is uh, Designing Sustainable Communities, which I've put a link to in the description. And it shows how instead of having a concrete sewer network that drains floodwaters and in some cases intermingles them with sewage from households. What they did in village homes in Davis, California was create natural drainage basins that worked like natural creek beds to store and soak floodwaters into the soil. And because of this, they were able to create this just gorgeous agricultural system around the houses in that development. When you visit Village Homes Davis, it's like an oasis in an otherwise parched landscape, in the large part due to this water policy, which has done a lot to recharge the groundwater in the area. Now, for areas that are prone to fire, there are several themes from a pamphlet from permaculture co-founder Bill Mollison that involve re-establishing low-fuel layered rainforest starting in the valleys. And I've put a link to that free pamphlet in the description as well. For all areas, whether these are burdened or growth areas, you need to try to make it work ecologically and economically for everyone. This reduces sprawl, strife, blight, and depopulation. What this means on the ground is pushing for walkable density, affordable housing in every neighborhood. I did a previous episode on this topic, and I'll post that at the end of this video. Pushing for public transit instead of highway expansions. Sensible water policy, and I'll do a whole separate episode on that at some point urban forestry, urban agriculture, to take the burden off of large-scale agriculture, and large-scale habitat restoration. So these are the big themes that we need to focus on. And I'll be returning to each of these themes in separate episodes to come. ProPublica reminds us Climate change will force a new American migration. We have had migrations of up to 3.5 million people suddenly moving from state to state 
in the past century, but it's likely that this new migration will be a lot worse. ProPublica cites a study that said that one in 12 Americans in the southern half of the country will move toward California, the mountain west, or the northwest over the next 45 years due to climate influences alone, and that such a shift is likely to increase poverty and widen the gulf between the rich and the poor. It will accelerate rapid, perhaps chaotic, urbanization of cities ill-equipped for the burden, testing their capacity to provide basic services and amplifying existing inequalities. This is exactly what I'm talking about when I advocate for affordable housing in all neighborhoods and a focus on transit-oriented development that lessens the burdens of income inequality, which will surely be part of any massive climate migration within the country. Nationwide, we are looking at a time of massive change. Managed wrong, this is going to look like a disaster. But if we focus on ecology and economic equity, I think we can end up with a much more prosperous and enjoyable way of life. And that's basically the Edenicity premise, that we've not really attended to urban design that much in the past, and that now that we have to, we have an opportunity to get it right. Now, let me just close with one example of some of the exciting positive possibilities. I know a lot of urbanists dump on Texas, and they have reason to. I mean, it's putting $85 billion into widening highways, which is just absurd. But Houston, for example, has created a Bayou Greenways initiative where in just the past 10 years, they revitalized nine waterways so that 60% of the population is within walking distance of a natural wetland area. And uh, it's really exciting. The, this has been covered by others. I'll put links in the description. But they've really done an amazing bit of work there. And Texas has also committed itself in various places, like in Austin, to transit-oriented development. So even in the same state that has doubled down on highway expansions, you see a renewed commitment in places to transit-oriented development. And the federal government is starting to put some serious investment behind this as well and restoring watersheds. So once again, here are the things we should be pushing for. And here are those episodes that I promised. This is the one about how cities can be built with no bad neighborhoods. This is the previous episode on climate migrations, in case you missed it. And this is the one on the ecology of transit, where I walk you through how we can supply emergency services even if we go completely car-free in our cities. Of course, this is the Edenicity reference design, which is also linked in the description. Take care, stay green, see you next time.